So I think that we have all had the experience of finding ourselves being required to question something that we once took for granted, to realize we could have been wrong. Uh, it, it could be just be an aha moment, and that happens to all of us, but even minor aha moments can feel like we're being now required to navigate the world differently with a whole new perspective. I've collected some examples of those moments of realization. Online, on social media, they are often called, I was today years old when, and then you fill in the blank. So, for instance, I was today years old when I found out that the first episode of a TV show is called a pilot because it's the first time it's on the air. I was today years old when I learned that when someone tells you to break a leg at an audition, it's because they're hoping you end up in the cast. I was today years old when I found out that the drawer at the bottom of the stove is for keeping food warm. It's not for storing cookie sheets. Now, I... yeah. I was today years old when I realized that stressed is just desserts spelled backwards. You probably have a few of those, and they can be kind of embarrassing to admit, especially when everyone else around you already seems to know, but don't worry. I won't ask you to share them in the comments. But I will share one. In fact, I'll share a few. Growing up, I had a series of children's picture books. Each one was a different story from the Bible. Now, before I learned to read, my mom or dad would set me on their lap and read them to me. I loved the illustrations, and I got a decent working knowledge of the Bible's greatest hits. Noah's Ark, Moses delivering the Ten Commandments, David and Goliath, Jonah and the Whale, and then there were several books that were about Jesus, of course, mostly his parables, the prodigal son, the lost sheep. Now, for reasons I can't explain, my favorite book, hands down, the one I requested over and over again, was The Good Samaritan. I love that story. Maybe because it felt like the plot of the rerun Western TV shows I used to watch, like The Lone Ranger or Gunsmoke. The Good Samaritan book, uh, children's book was like that. It was written and illustrated in a way that made it obvious who the bad guys were and who the good guys were, or a good guy was, really. Aside from the bandits themselves, the villains were the two pious religious leaders, the priest and the Levite. Now, I had no idea why they were bad guys. They just were. The good guy was the Samaritan, and to a lesser extent, his trusty sidekick, the innkeeper, who is paid to watch over the man who, who had been beaten up and left for dead by the side of the road. So, the moral of the story, be like the good guy, the Samaritan. Help people who've been beaten up and left for dead by the side of the road. It's the right thing to do, and God will love you for it. The end. Which, for a children's book, lacking in much subtlety, is not a bad message, I guess. Then I grew up, and I had a child of my own, and I had not thought of that book in years, but one day I found myself at the grocery store, and I noticed a cardboard display case full of children's books. And as I got closer to investigate, I got really excited because I realized the display contained all of those very same books I had loved so much as a child. Thirty years later... They even had the same covers and everything. So I had this warm and I had warm and fuzzy memories of my folks reading them to me. So all that nostalgia washed over me. I, and I wanted badly to share that same experience with my own son. And to my delight, right there was my very favorite, the Good Samaritan. So I bought it. I took it home, grabbed my son, plopped him on my lap, and I said, You're going to love this book. The problem was, by that time, I had grown up. And not only had I grown up, I'd spent a lot of time studying the Bible, including the parable of the Good Samaritan. I knew much more about who Samaritans were, who priests and Levites were, and most importantly, the context of the parable. I knew what the larger conversation was really all about that day, when Jesus had that encounter with a lawyer who was trying to test Jesus about religious law attempting to trip him up. 
So <clears throat> what it appeared to me as a child is a fairly straightforward story of good versus evil, right versus wrong. It was now not quite as simple as it had once seemed. It was not some black and white TV Western. I can even remember sitting in a classroom when I was in seminary and slapping my forehead over that realization. And that was just one of many moments when I had that feeling of being today years old. But my second today years old moment about the Good Samaritan came later when I sat down with my son to read him that book I'd enjoyed as a child, and I realized that this book I had loved so much only included the parable itself. Again, there was nothing wrong with the way it showed bad guys behaving badly and good guys behaving with compassion and nobility and grace. But the children's book was completely leaving out the most important part of the whole story, which is about the lawyer the lawyer who got things rolling by asking Jesus a question, by testing Jesus, as Luke tells it, to see if Jesus was being religiously correct or not. Because if Jesus was not being religiously correct, as his critics suspected, then the lawyer and all of his friends could then discredit him and his other wild ideas that the religious establishment thought were dangerous heresy. I could understand that all that might be a bit much to include in a children's picture book, but still, it blew me away to realize that the whole point of the parable, the real reason for Jesus even telling the parable in the first place, had been completely ignored. It was a moment, and I've had many since then, when I was today years old, when I understood that there are parts of the Bible, including many of the words and teachings of Jesus, that most of us sometimes never actually hear or ever have explained to us, or we have them explained to us through the lens of a particular bias, and we're not even aware of that bias. We just innocently assume the way that we've been told this story is the way it is, that it's right there in black and white, and that all Christians and everybody else sees that story in the same way. And that's true whether we grew up going to church or not. Now, maybe I'm naive, but I've been today years old plenty of times when I've heard a preacher speak about how, let's say, homosexuality is described as an abomination in the book of Leviticus, and everyone in the crowd says, Amen. So I've wondered, why doesn't the preacher give those people an actual definition of what the word abomination really means? The way he's saying it, it sounds like he's calling it some kind of a horrible sin. That's the implication. But the truth is, homosexuality was not something the people who wrote Leviticus even understood as a way of being human. They were not referring to sexual orientation because they lived in a place and time before modern understandings of human development and DNA and how sexual orientation and gender identity are just how we are wired together, and they're not a choice anyone makes. The Leviticus folks are writing about a particular behavior. Okay, you might say, but they're still calling that an abomination, right? Well, yeah, but again, what is an abomination? First of all, it's not a sin. It's not even equivalent to a sin. An abomination is a technical term for when you break a certain religious rule, and so you're not allowed then to participate in religious rituals. So it's not a moral issue, it's a ritualistic thing. Thing is, on the same level as homosexual behavior, the book of Leviticus also categorizes as abominations things like wearing blended fabrics, or eating meat and cheese together, or eating shellfish, or having any contact with a woman who's menstruating, or sacrificing a goat, with too many spots. Those are all abominations. We really have no clear idea why all that stuff and more were religious ritual taboos for ancient Hebrews. They just were. So the real question is, do any of those ancient religious ritualistic rules make sense for you and me today? Or are they better understood as relics of an ancient time when a group of people were attempting to distinguish themselves from other forms of religions and their customs and social norms by setting up certain religious rules for themselves? Why didn't those preachers say any of that stuff? 
So I have to admit that I was today years old when I realized that even though they might have known about those details, they still weren't sharing it with their congregations. They didn't share it on purpose because they didn't want to, because it wasn't a black and white morality tale story. And simple morality tales are just a whole lot easier to get across to people, whether they're children or whether they're grown up. And because their understanding of God is of a narrow-minded, judgmental, white-bearded old man up in the clouds who must be satisfied before we earn his love by pledging our allegiance to the right beliefs, and because it's easier and more efficient to start and grow a religion, if you insist that for you to be right, everyone else must be wrong and sadly misguided and ultimately our enemy, unless we convert them first, and only then can they be our friend but only our friend if they behave and believe exactly like we do. And because instead of thinking about what big words like abomination really mean, it's much easier to target a type of person as bad in order for us to be told we're the good guys. We all like to be told that. We appreciate clear-cut distinctions. We also have the human tendency to believe that people who are not like us might be our enemy and that they're dangerous and even to be feared. And fear, especially when it's wrapped in religious language and terms, is a very powerful motivator. And we have the tendency, we actually love it, when what we already believe to be true is confirmed by someone in a position of authority, like a preacher. It's comforting, like a nice bedtime story. The problem is that's not what Jesus was up to. Jesus never comforted anyone who felt secure in their religious beliefs. He challenged their beliefs. His whole mission was to take people's assumptions about who God accepts and loves and the way God works in the world and to turn that upside down, to far exceed those expectations, those limits. It's why people, like the lawyer in the story, tried to trip him up in the first place. Jesus was going around telling stories that made people say, Oh my gosh, I was today years old when I realized I'm valuable and accepted. And that God's not bound up in some dusty old words from Leviticus that could not be more irrelevant today if they tried. And God's not some angry old judgmental dude up in the clouds adding up our mistakes on a ledger. But that God lives and breathes through us in how we treat each other with kindness and compassion and grace. And that is what's meant by living eternally and being a citizen of the kingdom of God. And that's just what happened to the lawyer in the story when Jesus tells the Good Samaritan parable. The lawyer has to admit that he was today years old when he realized that maybe the holy men that he'd admired all of his life were no longer quite so holy. And maybe the least likely half-breed heretic person he had been brought up to despise and discriminate against, the Samaritan, was the one doing the holiest thing of all, loving his neighbor as himself. But the biggest moment by far of I was today years old is when we understand that in this story, we are that lawyer, you and me. We are that person who's so sure of ourselves and our concept of the holy that there's little room left for God to say, not so fast, open your heart, think again, and then again. Don't close off what's possible. Behind the black and white, easy to answer stories, we're taught we must believe in order to belong. Don't ask, but who is my neighbor? Or who is in and who is out? Because doesn't somebody need to be out in order for me to be in? That's the wrong question. Instead, ask, who in this world, where we're all connected by God's love, who could possibly not be my neighbor? The only honest answer is, no one could not be my neighbor because everyone already is my neighbor. Our job, our calling, is to learn that lesson fresh every single day, that I am today years old when I learn again the simple but amazing truth that I am loved and you are loved and all people are loved because God is love and God is alive in everyone and everything, myself, my neighbor, my world. Mm -hmm.